welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, and my wonderful wife is working in the pharmacy, so she will not be streaming with us today. Um, but I am super mm-hmm. excited to have Sarah and Justin Adair on our podcast today. They are the owners of Revival Wellness in Northern Idaho, and Sarah is a nurse, and she left traditional healthcare in Colorado, and she's going to discuss why. <clears throat> and she does some non-traditional things in her clinic now, and I'm super excited to to have met them a few weeks ago and and start working with them more. Um, Sarah and and Dustin, welcome to our show. Thanks. Good Thanks for having us. So tell us a little bit about your background, Sarah, and what made you leave traditional medicine. Okay. Yeah. So a majority of my uh, background was in emergency medicine and urgent care. Um, I was a nurse in the emergency department for about six years in a level one trauma center in Denver. Um, Really enjoyed that. Learned a lot. Um, But as I continued, got my FNP and started working in urgent care, um, saw that in both settings, there was patients coming to us for primary care stuff. So um, lacking, you know, basic medical care um, and just seeing really, really sick people that, you know, had progressed where, with things that can be prevented. I mean, of course, diabetes is one of the biggest things um, and seeing how sick that was making people. And we were just kind of band-aiding them um, and what, you know, there was such a lack of basic primary, you know, care. Um, And seeing how that was really inundating the system and causing such a huge, huge problem. So what are your thoughts about diabetes? My my wife and I are two pharmacists that we don't believe in medications to treat type 2 diabetes. Um, We believe that type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle disease and it's... No matter how you define diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2, it's a carbohydrate metabolism problem. Now, the treatment for type 1 versus type 2 is different, but with type 2, um, you don't lack medications. Um, okay. You're eating the wrong stuff and you're eating too much of it, period. So nope. do you think that our system yeah. likes to keep yeah. diabetics sick? Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And our, you know, our overall world right now with how much we push processed foods, how we make it so convenient and cheap. Um, makes that easier for people to become sick. Um, you know, you could pick up a, a hamburger and fries and a Coke for six bucks or, you know, um, you know, you're trying to feed a whole, an entire family. And, and those choices are much cheaper currently than the, the foods that are actually healthy for you. And so um, I don't have figures in front of me, but I mean, it's clear that this the diabetes is, is becoming a huge problem. Um, and it's starting in young young kids, um, mm. you know, and they're not learning healthy lifestyle choices, exercise, just the basic stuff mm. of being healthy. Well, you hit it right there. <clears throat> Schools started taking away um, physical education out of the school system. There's a huge problem right there that's enabling this health pandemic, you could call it if you wanted mm-hmm. to, <clears throat> you know, and, and really starting them young in bad choices, bad personal health choices. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know this is true of all schools, but I, I do know that they have decreased their physical education programs and even recess because the, I guess the kids were running around too much on recess. Yeah. Go figure. You know, I mean, seriously, I mean, we, we expect these kids to be in school for seven hours. Oh, a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah sitting at a desk and it's like seriously i mean you know we need to you know kids need to be running around and you know i'm gonna i'm gonna beat up on some people here but i I think it's a parenting problem you know um as parents we need to be good good role models for our kids yeah and if we're not they're gonna follow our habits and i'll tell you i've been guilty of that i had a son that was obese when i was obese I lost weight, then he lost weight, and now we're we're a healthy family. Um, so it comes it, it it comes from the parents, and it is like you say, Sarah. The the diabetes in younger people, like in their twenties, unreal. We used to never see that. Now it's people that are in their twenties that have to do diabetes. 
Yeah, yeah, I know it's awful. Um, so, and getting back to, too, like you mentioned, showing uh, families how, you know, proper good lifestyle habits. So cooking at home, like having a, di a dinner as a family um, and getting your kids involved with learning how to cook and being healthy. I think we've kind of gone the wayside with that as well. Well, I think part of the reason is, is because a lot of people don't cook at home anymore, let alone teach their kids. Yeah. Right. So yep. tell us about what you do in your clinic that's special. Yeah, so we are, uh, we're a wellness center. So I try to incorporate as many wellness ideas as possible. So the base of my business or clinic is hormone replacement for men and women. Um, I think that's important, particularly as we get a little bit older and start to not produce those things naturally like we used to. Um, for an overall healthy um, lifestyle. Um, there's so many important things to hormone replacement um, and being healthy. Um, I also do IV therapy. So um, you, it's some people do it for maintenance. Some people do it for when they're not feeling well, just to give them a little extra boost. Um, and then medical weight loss. So helping people get back to a healthy weight and then, you know, dive into, you know, why they're heavy in the first place, seeking out the medical weight loss um, and then getting them back on their wellness journey. <clears throat> yes. I think the, the thing I like to mention when we talk about obesity and, and some people don't like hearing this, but obesity is the most dangerous thing we can do as an American is to be overweight. Um, obesity related disease kills more Americans than anything related to cardiovascular disease, mostly heart attacks and strokes, um, and all kinds of other, you know, side effects and symptoms of obesity, whether it be, um, sleep apnea or, or whether it be plantar fasciitis or whether it be bad knees, bad hips. Um, not only does it kill more people, but it is, um, definitely, you know, decreases a lot of people's function um, more than anything else. So this, the, the best thing we can do for our body is to tr try to be ideal body composition. I don't mention ideal body weight because because um, BMI is not always the best way to look at, at uh, <coughs> you know, at at uh, weight. So I, I don't say ideal body weight. I say I, ideal body body composition. So what, what are your thoughts about obesity and the dangers in, that it, that it presents in, in our healthcare system? Oh, I mean, you're right. Obesity affects so many different aspects of your overall health, your, your organ health, your cardiac health, your musculoskeletal health, your GI health. Um, but in relation to that, it really just inundates our healthcare system. So these people that are not caring for themselves properly for whatever reason, um, and then causing these chronic illnesses are then getting super sick to the point where we're having to kind of patch them, um, you know, and it's really, uh, it affects the healthcare system in a huge way. Um, getting, you know, having to be on chronic medicines that they probably don't need in one medicine causing another side effect. And then you're patching that side effect with this medicine. And it's just this cycle um, and they stay on it, not knowing and, and not getting back to the roots of the, of the cause of all that. So you talk about healthy diet, you talk about healthy exercise. Um, sometimes when we mention exercise, exercise can be a four letter dirty word. Um, so will you expand on what exercise yes. means? <laughs> yeah. So exercise can be, it's a, it's a broad range and it can be very, very simple. It, it can be a 10 to 15 minute walk a majority of the days of the week, you know, and I agree when people 
when you hear, when you encourage exercise, they think that you need to be pounding it out at the gym for hours and hours and hours. And that's not the case. You can do very simple things to improve your overall health, your bone density, all those kinds of things with very simple things like taking literally just taking a walk through your neighborhood um, a majority of the days of the week. And it's also important to do strength training. And, and again, you don't have to be burn it out in the gym. It can be, you can get a simple set of weights, you know, for, for women, myself, I have a bands. very, yeah, or bands, resistance bands. They're very inexpensive and you can do a lot of different exercise with those using your own weight. You can, you can exercise. You don't need a gym membership to be healthy. You can get these little things. You can get a jump rope for 10 bucks. I mean, just doing simple things like that. And it doesn't need to be hours. If you can carve out half an hour a day, incorporate some yoga. If you, if you prefer to do that, you know, if you find getting really physical is difficult, start with yoga. You know, there's baby steps that you could be doing and every little bit helps. Well, and that's just it. Everybody start, you got to start somewhere. So what I tell people is that, yep. you know, if they don't exercise at all, it's really easy to start because all you got to do is like you say start with five minutes of walking a day just start there you know and and, and progress and yep. when it comes to gym time or or resistance yep. training set, you don't set even, little goals yeah yeah and when it comes to gym time you don't even need um um weights necessarily or bands use body weight stuff do body weight squats do push-ups do pull-ups there's a lot of things that you can do mm-hmm. Uh, without weights. I mean, you got to think that, you know, in the history of, of humankind, um, gyms really have only gotten popular in the last 40 years. Seriously. Before that, nobody went to the gym. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> and people were in better shape. Than <laughs> they are now. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yes. Well, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with our you know, quick, instant gratification kind of, you know, lifestyle we're in right now. And people don't take the time to, to, you know, enjoy their day and do something for themselves. They're always rush, 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 um, you know, especially busy families. And I get that they're trying to encourage their kids to be active, but the, in, in that they lose the importance of their own, you know, health care and self care. Yeah, Absolutely. So if there was one tip, if you had to give one tip on diet, what would it be? Protein. (laughs) Get your protein. Um, I think we, so yeah, and it can depend on your, on your, uh, your fitness uh, level and your activity level, but Um, A very basic tool that I help some of my weight loss patients with is using your fist as as a template. So your meat should be should fit the palm of your hand. That should be the size. Um, Your fiber. So your vegetables should fit a cup. So if you were to make a cup with your hand, roughly about that size. And then your fatty oils should be about the size of your thumb. And so keeping those basic things in mind helps. Um, Reducing your carbs, if you can, your, you know, your complex carbs, because those, of course, turn into sugar. It's not to say you can't enjoy rice or pasta here and there, but that shouldn't be the main portion of your plate. It should be, you should consume your protein first, then your fiber. And if you have any extra room, you can do a little bit of carb. Um, and, and, of course, minimizing sweets. I know that's hard for a lot of people, but um, that should be minimized as well. I like the protein goal and and eating the meat first because I will tell you in my own um, life, if I eat the meat first, I don't eat any – I eat a lot less crap later. Yes. Yep, 100%. And red meat is good for you. That should be consumed uh, in your daily diet. I know. Let, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, red meat got vilified for 70 years, causing heart attacks and and um, all these other issues. But I don't believe there is a better food than red meat. It is so nutrient dense. It is concentrated in nutrients. It has um, 
hemoglobin, um, um, heme in it, I, I, hemoglobin, and iron in it, and it, there's no better way to increase your iron stores than red meat. Um, lots of protein, just lots, lots of nutrients. Um, it's actually amazing how cows can take and eat grass and concentrate it into 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 meat. It's an, it's an amazing <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember my grandma telling me a story about her her mother was anemic and so her doctor would write a prescription for liver mm-hmm. and she would have to take it to the butcher uh, and they'd give her, you know, liver and she was required by her doctor to eat that once a week. Um, you know, the liver gets a bad rap, but it's very iron dense. Uh, and, you know, a lot of women actually need iron because we have menstruation, but, um, you know, everybody needs iron, of course. Well, and here's the thing going back on the red meat. Um, you know, here's what I tell people. If, if red meat w- is bad for us, then how come our grandparents, great grandparents, great, great, great grandparents and generations before them survived on it? If red meat was bad for them, we wouldn't be here. We lived on it. <laughs> right. 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 Same thing with eggs. I think eggs get a bad rap and they are so good for you. Um, it's a fantastic way to get start your day with a good source of protein. Protein should be the first thing you consume in the day. And, you know, a little scramble of eggs will keep you full for a little while and you get your protein in um, and they're good for you. Well, and let's just think about what eggs are. I mean, eggs are made to nourish a baby chicken. Um, you know, so think about how nutrient dense and caloric dense, which is not necessarily a bad thing, um, that it must be in order to nourish a baby chicken. Yeah. And, and here's what I think about eggs. I think eggs are one of the most, um, satiating foods around. I know when we eat eggs, Jan will say, how many eggs do you want? I'm like, uh, give me three. Yeah. And after two, I'm done. I mean, seriously, it, eggs are very, very filling. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Agreed. Yep. So what is your most popular IV at um, Revival Wellness? Um, it's generally it's um, the Myers mix or immunity boost. Um, people really like the immunity boost. It's a higher volume of uh, or milligrams of um, vitamin C. So vitamin C is always good for Um, overall wellness and uh, boosting your immune system. Um, That one also has zinc in it, that infusion, but the base is always calcium, magnesium, and vitamin B complex. So you're getting those um, vitamins as well. And how often do you recommend somebody get some Myers cocktail? I mean, really, kind of depends. You can get an infusion really every week if you wanted to. Um, Some people will do them twice a month, some just once a month, but really you could, depending on the ingredients and of course your your medical history and such, um, you can get them weekly infusions. So when we talk about hormones, um, testosterone always comes up and some people are erroneously taught (laughs) right some people are erroneously taught that women don't need testosterone tell us about testosterone for women yeah so important um testosterone for both men and women play a huge role in all kinds of um functions in your body so it's good for your bone health it's good for your skin it's good for your cardiac uh system um but it also plays a, a role specifically in libido for women it uh, uh helps with vaginal dryness um but really it just uh, is great for women overall for you know their sexual well-being as well same with men um, which of course is very important in relationships um, and is often the, the the driving force as to why both men and women come into the clinic they're just where you know what happened to my libido is it something wrong with me you know that that kind of often is what drives them in 
um, and notice a huge difference once they get started on treatment um, with supplementing their testosterone. Um, I, I love treating couples because I love hearing sometimes it's too much information, but I really enjoy it because they're back, you know, feeling great. Their sex lives have improved and overall just feeling much better. Um, I know it, it's not traditionally taught in medical schools to some degree, more so with medical doctors. I never got taught it in, um, in the college I went to. Um, the importance of all of this, it was just kind of, you know, briefly discussed. I even remember a day in class um, where they were talking about the Women's Health Initiative and the whole estrogen and progesterone problem and saying, you know, you should never have women on supplementation after this age, um, even though, it, and they did bring it up that there was benefits for cardiac health. And I said, well, then why don't we do that? Oh, you know, the risk is too great, you know, of stroke and all this. And I just thought that to be very strange. So, um, you know, cause women do need all that stuff too. And, uh, it's in the general medical community, um, which I think is a fault with our institutions. Um, it's not prescribed. And so people are having to go outside of the healthcare system with their insurance and such to seek out, you know, the care that they know they need uh, because they don't feel well and keep getting pushed off by doctors um, and through the, the traditional healthcare system. And I've been able to, my husband is an example, get him off his blood pressure medicines, statins, all that stuff when you're replacing these hormones that you, that you don't need. Right. Well, and there's no benefit for say big pharma or, or in the insurance companies, the insurance world to keep people healthy either. Right. So why would we promote or why would they promote um, in the education system? Because I think we're aware at this point that big pharma and insurance companies are dictating what care. what care is being taught through the collegiate system and continued education. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't provide a benefit for anybody other than the consumer to actually be healthy and address underlying conditions, such as hormone loss, natural hormone loss. And we all do it as we age. Um, and there's, there's a pill for that. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of, you know, a cycle It's a downward spiral, um, kind of a death, death spiral, yeah. you know, to get on that pharmaceutical uh, train. Yeah. Here's your antidepressant, which helps nobody. It just causes more issues. Yeah, I mean, you said it, Dustin. Um, the healthcare system has been hijacked by big pharma, and insurance companies are in collusion with them to create a cartel to rip off consumers. And it has nothing to do with good health, that's for sure. Um, and when it comes to hormone replacement, I mean, let's think about testosterone. This is what I always say What if we had a drug that could decrease depression, increase bone density, increase lean body mass? Um, increase energy, um, decrease cholesterol, decrease cardiovascular accidents, um, decrease dementia. Uh, gosh, what am I missing? Um, increase, decrease erectile dysfunction, decrease vaginal dryness, increase libido. What if we had a drug like that? Man, that'd be a magic drug. We've got it. It's called testosterone. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, I'm, I am probably a perfect example of exactly what you just said. I've lost weight. I've become healthier. I've uh, taken myself off these prescription medications. I have better controlled um, emotional output. You know, yeah. I, I used to have, you know, highs and lows in my emotional um, emotional state throughout the entire day. Mm -hmm. And now that's all evened out. I'm overall healthier. I'm overall happier. I enjoy myself great, you know, more. Um, and I, I just, I look forward to every day where that wasn't always the case, you know, wow, here's another day that I'm, I'm going to feel like crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say I am probably a perfect example of everything you just listed off. Yep. We see it all the time in our practice. And what do they usually say in traditional medicine, Dustin? Oh, you know, yeah, you're 40 years old. You're just getting depressed. Here's Prozac. What? I mean, seriously, let, let, let's, it's let's normal. Yeah. yeah, right, right. It's just normal. Or 
I love the one you're talking about sexual health, um, Sarah. I love the one. Well, as we age, it's just normal to not to not care about sex as much. And we just don't have as much sex as when we age. It's just normal. What I tell people is if their doctor tells them that, get a new doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's not, no, no. Your sexual health is just as important when you're in your twenties as when you're in your fifties and sixties and beyond. It can, you can still have a very sexual health, healthy sexual life. And with that, you, you are close to your partner and what makes you more happy than being intimate and close with somebody? Well, and what and I tell people, people with healthy relationships tend to live longer anyways. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and here's what I say. Healthy people have regular sex and regular sex keeps you healthy, period. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I with with what we do, as much as I can reach out to as many people as I can help, I'm I'm so happy for that. It's just. Uh, I get frustrated with the barriers of people having to pay out of pocket, you know, use they're paying for their insurance premiums and not getting the help that they need. And now they're having to use their own money. And that's, you know, not feasible for everybody. Um, and at some point I'm hoping, you know, it might be decades down the road, but changing our healthcare system, getting back to, you know, telling the, the the big pharma in these industries that no, I'm taking charge of my health. I want to be healthy without all the pharmaceuticals. I want to dictate my own health care. I don't want to be told by an insurance company. And that's the reason why I don't take insurance is because I don't want to be told how to practice medicine. They aren't ner- practitioners. They are insurance companies. Yeah. Amen to that. And I think one thing that happened during COVID, Sarah and Dustin, is that COVID exposed the evils of the traditional healthcare system. And so people are waking up and saying, you know what, no more. I'm going to do what I, ha- what I can do to not have to utilize the healthcare system. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you mentioned we've been hijacked, and that's, that's exactly correct. Um, but we've also allowed it. So the, the people have allowed their their personal health to be hijacked by big pharma, by insurance, be dictated by them. And now they're starting to reach out, just like Sarah was saying, they're starting to branch out on their own. It's like, you know what? It, it's my turn. And nobody's going to do that unless somebody starts it. Right. And that's that's where we're at. Like to break free of the tr- traditional medical system, medical care, somebody has to be able to stand up and be willing to say, you know what, I'll take lead. I'll go do this. I'll provide another opportunity or an outlet for better health care. I will do that. And there, there needs to be more people, you know, more providers that are willing to take that risk. It's scary. Right, Sean? Mm-hmm. It's scary. <laughs> well, he gets it. He opened, <laughs> yeah. he opened a pharmacy and he's doing fantastically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like the idea that we're seeing a lot more of people like yourself leaving the traditional system because the traditional system, as much as I would like to change it, and I think eventually it might, but right now, I think it's just nice to have a parallel system. Um, and speaking of insurance, we don't have to have traditional insurance. My wife, and I don't have traditional insurance. We have a health sharing ministry, um, Christian healthcare, and we absolutely love it. We get to go to the provider we want to go to. We get to have the treatments that we want to have. Um, we don't have an insurance company dictating our health and that's what insurance companies do. And nobody really wants a, an insurance company dictating their health. And I'm just going to go out there and say this. There's no such thing. If if you have traditional insurance, whether it's government insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, Premier Blue Cross, United, if you have traditional insurance, it's all government insurance because it's so heavily regulated. The government says what's covered at what price, and it's not good insurance. Mm -hmm. When people say, well, I have good health insurance. No, you don't. If it's (laughs) none of it's good. And those of us that have worked in the system, we know (laughs) it's not. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So That's as so you, 
As we wrap this podcast up, Sarah and Dustin, tell us um, how to get a hold of you at Revival Wellness if anybody has any questions. Yeah, so um, that's our website, and there you can even book yourself at your own appointment, which is nice. Um, but there's also a contact that if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. Um, we're also on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I do monitor all those and get back to all questions. And certainly you can call the, the phone numbers at the bottom of the website, and it's also on the contact us uh, link. Um, and happy to answer any questions, happy to do consultations, just whatever to get, you know, spread the information, get the word out. So I, I appreciate you guys being on our podcast. You guys have helped us realize our goal of this podcast, which is to educate and empower consumers to take charge of their own health. That's the only way we're going to fix this problem is consumers need to take charge of their own health. So you guys have helped us realize that goal. I totally appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on our podcast today. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate Bye. it. Bye, Sean. And listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham on our midweek podcast. Tune in Monday, our regularly scheduled podcast, 1230 to 130 Pacific Standard Time, Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you.